Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask in our ignorance and asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Here ends the reading. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they got to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch 
even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In ten days, St. Stephen's will hold a celebration of new ministry on Wednesday, July 28th at 6.30 p.m. in the evening. And of course, all are welcome. It will begin with the blessing of an outdoor memorial baptismal font by Bishop Samuel Rodman, the diocesan bishop for the Diocese of North Carolina. And it will end with a reception in the parish hall organized by our church life committee on behalf of the entire parish. In between, a letter of induction will be read. The wardens will formally call me as the rector. Vestry members will read, usher, and present a number of symbolic gifts that signify our mutual ministry as a parish. Visiting clergy will read the gospel and preach. And members of my own family will present the offertory. Communion as bread and wine will be offered in a safe and reverent manner, and music will fill the air, and songs fill the masks of all to make our hearts glad. Ostensibly, this event will mark the parish's official welcome to me as the rector, but really, so much more is going on here. You see, a celebration of new ministry is really a celebration of the work of the Holy Spirit. Gathered together in a particular place, as a particular people, living and worshiping in a particular location at a particular time in salvation history, in this case, St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, 140 College Street, Oxford, North Carolina, 27565. In a sense, our celebration of new ministry is like the renewal of vows between spouses after long years of marriage, but more so. For this time, it will be us in a church on the east side of College Street who will be renewing our vows with God, whose official address is general delivery everywhere, forever. Amen. For St. Stephen's, our marriage began in two, 200 years ago in parishioner homes, though our recognition as a parish of the Diocese of North Carolina came about in 1823. And so we anticipate our bicentennial, even as we celebrate another transition in a long line of transitions that each of us contributes to and benefits from in ways we can never fully comprehend. That's how the Holy Spirit works. In other words, our upcoming celebration of new ministry is about all of us preparing the way of love for those we will never know in the future. Just as our predecessors prepared the way for us without ever knowing who we might be, apart from fellow children of God. And in a sense, our celebration of new ministry in 10 days will be yet another entry into the annals of church salvation history, which commenced with the epistles, the gospels, and the acts of the apostles, and which will continue to the end of time, whatever that may look like. 
yet it is our, your call for me to be St. Stephen's latest rector that occasions our celebration. And so I feel I must place my part in this mutual call also in the context of today's scripture. Through Jeremiah, the Lord said, I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing. Of course, he was speaking about the chosen people of the Old Covenant, already decimated by earlier covenant violations, exiles, and internecine war. Invoking the image of sheep and shepherd as a single working unit, Jeremiah seeks to comfort the people with something familiar to them, herding. They knew, as few of us do in modern times, that one herds more often from behind or on the sides than from in front of the flock, especially if it is hungry. It's also almost comical to think of the confident shepherd walking purposely with no sheep behind as they, the sheep, have literally left off for greener pastures than those the shepherd confidently, if foolishly, marches toward alone, unheeded. Better it is for the shepherd to follow the sheep as they go forward to pastures they need, full of good nourishment beside still waters, full of glad refreshment. By keeping the sheep from falling off a cliff, drowning in a torrent stream, getting hung up in the brambles, or being eaten and attacked by a wolf, whether in sheep's clothing or not, the shepherd nudges, encourages, and protects the flock on its way toward the gated resting place set aside, and to which the shepherd runs ahead in order to open the gate just before they arrive. Would, however, that parishes behaved in real time, now or ever, like flocks of sheep? I, for one, am glad they do not. Though I believe the shepherd-sheep metaphor is still applicable, if not divinely ordained, when it comes to pastoral concerns. I know few clergy, however, who have not experienced some form of sheep attack or stampede at some point in their ministry, a congregational revolt or internal division. And so I find it useful to move beyond the sheep and shepherd image to own the fact that parish clergy are pastors, yes, but also priests and rectors. And to remember, too, that every member of the church, every order of ministry, as the Book of Common Prayer states, has the Good Shepherd, Christ, whose image we bear and whose care we share with each other to follow above all. And so, if I had to describe the roles apportioned to clergy embedded in the Good Shepherd image, I would say this. The pastor brings the comfort of Christ. The priest brings the body and blood of Christ. And the rector brings the rule of Christ. Together, all three bear the image of Christ into the world. Amen. A general thanksgiving. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, 
and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him, at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen.